a nice chaos actually. It's nice to have a little bit of chaos with musicians and artists and writers. So let us all be patient because they have played some beautiful music and they made this morning very nice. Thank you, Amita Budak. Thank you, Kolkata Youth Ensemble. You really made it a beautiful morning. We are ready to start. In case uh, the speakers want to uh, come up amidst this chaos and start, or should we wait for a couple of more minutes? Uh, come up. Come up slowly on the stage. They'll be all right. From here. is very important Hello. in our lives. It's becoming more and more important. Uh, what we do with food, how we cook it, how we eat it, how we preserve it, what should we eat, what we should not eat. I am looking forward to this panel talking about food, which is, I think, the most important thing in our lives today, because it concerns not just the taste, but also our health. So should I hand over to the panel? You've been introduced, Damanti Datta, Kavita Devgan, Sanjukta Bose, uh, Indrajit Lairi. Thank you for coming and let us start. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sen. Hello. So, hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon hello. and welcome to the first session of the second day of the Kolkata Literature Festival. Hello. It's quite fitting that the clock um, is nearing the lunch hour because we are all going to talk about food right now. We all come from very different walks of life. I'm a journalist. Kavita is a nutritionist. Sanjukta is the head of a hospitality school, and Indrajit is an IT entrepreneur. But what is common to all of us? Hey, Shankoda, mic katik korun. Right. So, what is common to all of us is the fact that we are all storytellers of food. We talk about food not just because we are uh, foodies, uh, but we talk about food because we are concerned with the way we eat now. Uh, very recently, uh, some of the top scientists of the world came together to say that by 2050, uh, we are going to have a 10 billion strong population and the planet just doesn't have enough food for all that people unless we change the way we eat now. And India has also come under a very heavy criticism. It, uh, the report came out in the uh, medical journal Lancet that India is the hub of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. So obviously the way we are eating is all wrong. My book, um, Sugar, the Silent Killer, is about one such ingredient behind this health disaster. When I say sugar, I don't mean the uh, crystal granules on your kitchen shelf. I mean all sorts of bad carbohydrates which turn into sugar in your body. For instance, white rice, white bread, white sugar, all things uh, processed, convenient, that become sugar in your body. Now, I don't know if you know about it, but India discovered sugar some 5,000 years ago. 
and ever since we have had a very close relationship with sugar, um, almost a cultural addiction. Uh, yet we never had these epidemics of diseases. Every ritual in our lives, from birth to weddings to death, are paved with sugar. Yet, we have never had diabetes as an epidemic, heart disease as an epidemic, or obesity. Why is that? Have we lost a precious way of healthy eating? Um, why is it? that we don't uh, eat like we used to, as our ancestors did. So as a journalist, I went around temples to take a look and find out how our ancestors used to eat. And I went to um, you know, taste some of the foods of the gods. Surprisingly, in some of the greatest temples, in Varanasi at the Annapurna temple, for instance, um, Two of the staples are black sesame seeds with rice and sag for such a mighty goddess. I went to Kaligat here, at the temple, and uh, surprisingly, the goddess apparently loves kochu, uh, taro roots. And then there is uh, the mighty Devi Durga whose crown apparently touches the sky, as she's described in Devi Mahatya. Her favorite food is pantabhat, which is an extremely humble uh, food of common people. So what's going on? And then we have the Buddha, who has taken over the world with his mindful eating and intermittent fasting. So that is the fundamental question that I'm going to ask today. And I'm hoping my uh, colleagues and friends will have all sorts of insight into this disconnect between the way we used to eat once and the way we eat now. So Kavita, Kavita has a wonderful book. Um, it's one of her favorite and one of mine too. Uh, it's about grandmother hacks, the way our ancestors used to eat and some of the kitchen tricks and treats. So Kavita, would you tell us a little bit about uh, some insight from your book on this. So, thank you, Namyanti, and I'm very glad to be here today in uh, Kolkata, um, a city which celebrates food. So, this is very apt that we are having the first session here as on food and on healthy food at that. So, I totally agree with what you are saying, Namyanti, and what you've mentioned in your book about sugar becoming our enemy today. So what I would like to clarify here is sugar per se is not the enemy and which is what I talk about in my book as well. No food can be our enemy as long as we know how to eat it. And somehow I feel that our, you know, ancestors, I won't even go very long back, I'll probably just go to our grandmothers. They somehow knew it by observation or by common sense, I don't know because there were no studies or researchers then then but they somehow knew how much to eat of what. And that is the basic principle. Once we can get that pat on, know which food to have more of, the good ones eat more of that, and the bad ones eat less of uh, those, I think the biggest question of what to eat, which this session is all about, and how to eat gets solved there itself. If we recall our traditional thalis, it always had a meter in it. It's supposed to have a small amount of meter. But if you remember the quantity of that mitai, I mean, that's how it was supposed to be eaten. Just a small bit to satisfy your taste buds and your soul. Because like Ayurveda also says, you need some madura in your diet. So sugar is not the enemy. Similarly, carbs. Uh, you know, somebody was just asking me if we should go off carbs completely. Not the enemy. Same goes for fat. The point is, if we can know how much to eat. And for that, I believe, we just need to look back a little. It's good to look forward. It's good to look ahead and look at what the research is saying today. But 
always temper your decisions of eating food based on what your generations have been eating. Like for example, I have a chapter in this book, Ultimate Grandmother Hacks, which says, eat like your grandmother, not someone else's grandmother, which is the most important crux of what I've been trying to say in not just this book, but in almost every book of mine. All five books of mine are based on this principle. And this is not something I learned during my nutrition studies and my masters. This is something I've learned probably from my mother to whom it is dedicated. Follow common sense, formula logic, follow the principle of moderation, look back, see what your body is used to. And now science has proven it, Ravyanti, that our genetics are actually positioned in a way that they can handle the foods that our ancestors have been eating which is why that whole thing of eat seasonal, eat local comes in. You know, sarso ka tail will work better for people who've been cooking in that for a long time. Similarly, coconut oil works better for those who've been having it. So where is the debate of what is good for you and what is bad for you? Little bit of ghee on the fulka, I think everybody's, every grandmom has been insisting on. And now research has proven that it's good for us. And this is just one example. I mean, if you look at all the other examples, the nimbu pani, you know, that early morning people used to have, what does that do? That basically creates the right acid alkali balance in your gut. And now we all know what Ayurveda has been speaking about for years, that the seat of your health and your immunity is in your gut. Sort out your gut and you'll be able to sort out everything. I mean, that's the biggest chapter in my last book, The Immunity Diet. I talk about that and these are lessons that we've learned from the past. So just do not let go of the past, I would say. Keep it in the forefront. Keep experimenting, keep adding all the new good things to your diet. But the mainstay of your diet should be your Indian traditional diet that you are used to or your something that like, it's a very cliched sentence but if your grandmother wouldn't recognize a food, do not eat it. If you look at something and say, would my nani or dadi know what this is? If, they, if you think the answer is no, it's not for you as well. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you something. See, um, people migrate a lot these days. I mean, I may have been born in Calcutta, but I may work uh, somewhere else in the world. So what do I do with, well then? How do I follow my family's history? Because the food ingredients change. The point is I'm trying to make is the basics remain, need to remain the same. You need to include new ingredients in your diet. So you could get good, the point is eating good fat, right? If you're not able to source ghee and if you're somewhere where you can source avocado, have the avocado. The point is stick to the basic rules do not be rigid about the food per se, but stick to the basic rules. Same goes for carbohydrates, same goes for fiber, same goes for everything else. Um, I'll come back to you again. Sanjukta, I wanted to ask you something. You know, uh, we are talking about food then and now, and you are uh, somebody who's preparing uh, generation next huh? to make food, to make uh, sustainable food, nutritious food. How do you do that? Uh, do you need a mic? Hmm. Yes, uh, just listening to you, both of you have authored books on food and sugar and... Can you hear her? Right. Hello. Huh. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, the basic uh, discussion uh, was of the diet chart. And uh, as uh, you said that we are responsible, I'm from a hotel management institute where we prepare chefs. And uh, these chefs will be cooking food in the restaurants, in many places, in the, and a lot of cafes are opening. And uh, especially after the pandemic, we have seen that um, of, uh, the hospitality industry has taken up a lot of responsibility hmm. about sustainability, whether it's food or whatever we use in this uh, sector. And uh, recently we had a young chef Olympia, you know, everybody's speaking about this. When 
Uh, more than 50 countries participate from all over the world. And uh, as you are asking me about the sustainable food, it's a big thing which we are trying to do. Because what if our children cook uh, sustainable what food. What really is sustainable food? A lot of people wouldn't know that. What do you yes, understand uh, by that? The food, uh, first of all, healthy food. Food, local food, as you said, local food are very important. Because whenever we think of cafes or five-star restaurants, we use a lot of uh, ingredients which are imported. Right. Now, why uh, not a substitute of the things which are imported? Or uh, which because if we use the uh, local food, it is not only cheaper, it's healthier because no uh, addi uh, additional things are added to bottle it, uh, can it. Uh, so if you use, uh, so a lot of importance are given on using the uh, local food and seasonal food also. Right. Not eating th things which are not produced in the season. Like uh, in this uh, particular young uh, uh, chef, we had a competition where you used millet. Joa, and so by Indian millets, we mean Joar, Bajra, Bajra and Ragi. And the uh, international chefs, they use these ingredients to make sauces, to make wraps, to make cutlets, and a lot of things. So once the uh, children, we pr the chefs we produce, uh, which who will run the industry, if they become aware of the food which is available, the spices which can be uh, produced locally, the sauces which can be produced locally, not only it becomes cheaper, but it is more healthier because no extra ingredients are added while importing it. That's what, that's very important actually because they are the ones, but whenever we speak about the, like we were speaking about grandmother's kitchen and every, everybody will agree with me, what we cook at home is either we are cooking or the helping hand is cooking. It's all about the local uh, like food we eat as a Bengali, as a Maharashtrian, as a Tamil. What you eat is produced at home. Then that ding dong and the swiggy comes and the children shift their eating habit. They will not eat that. Everything is made and the children start eating outside food. So when the, the young generation has to be made uh, very conscious about their eating habit. And that's what we are trying to do. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you again. Yes. Indrajit, um, your blogs and YouTube uh, channel is so popular. Um, so you have a very different perspective on food. And what's your insight on the way this disconnect between the way we used to one eat once and the way we eat today? Is there a lot of disconnect, do you think? I honestly don't think so. Okay. Practically, what we try to showcase via our blog is the food stories. So we don't go about good food, bad food, ugly food, whatever. We talk about food stories. The way we used to eat was more a home-cooked food. Mm -hmm. And now that the outside food has stepped in. But what is outside food? Let's understand that mm -hmm. first. If I uh, take an example of a roll, of a very popular chicken roll in Calcutta, which is probably going to be the next national food of Calcutta, what is it? It's a paratha with some stuffing put in, with some salad and some sauce or the, or the foreign version of chutney to go with it. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about it as paratha with uh, chicken or meat or egg or sabzi with some salad. It can be put like that. The problem comes when we do not measure uh, how much to eat and when to eat. There the problem starts. See, if I may put it in a slightly uh, non-official fashion, food or bad food, uh, uh, food per se is a lot towards love. So <laughs> less of love is bad. We all know that. <laughs> and definitely a lot of love even kills even faster. At my age, we, we obviously know that. But food is something like that. Too much of sugar, it kills people. And less sugar or no sugar Can doesn't really uh, uh, do us any good either. Absolutely. So I have a pretty different perspective on this. You know, I, um, I don't know if people understand by good sugar and bad sugar. Uh, so I would request all of you to talk a little bit about that. Because uh, 
Sugar is essential for the body. Every cell in our body is covered with sugar. And our brain consumes 50% of the sugar that we take, even to think it needs sugar. But the problem begins when we sort of, uh, you know, have different kind of sugar which are not natural. According to some doctors, I met uh, Dr. Devi Shetty, and he was saying that our problem is that we uh, have started eating outside uh, sugars from outside, not fruits, not vegetables, not any other natural sources of sugar, but other things. So do you think in the past, when um, we didn't have such health disasters hanging on our head, do you think um, we were more aware about natural foods? Or do you think these other processed foods were just not available? One, they were not available, so th they did live in a better time. The temptations were less. It's difficult to resist temptations. Everybody would agree. But having said that, honestly, like when I grew up, the simple, if I can give you one example, the straightforward message was eat the fruit. Do not have the juice. It was just understood that you're supposed to eat the fruit. So now today I know why that was, why that made sense. With the sugar in the fruit, you're getting the fiber, you're getting a whole lot of other things. So the sugar gets absorbed slowly and there is no harm. It won't harm you in the body. Uh, secondly, I think the refining industry was not probably that developed. So the options that they had were unrefined sugars, which of course, Calorie-wise, they are the same. If you ask me, a jaggery or a sugar or any other uh, source of sugar would give you the same amount of calories. But the fact is, the less refined food you have, and that goes for every single food. Um, food. It goes for grains, like she mentioned, millets. It goes for uh, oils. It goes for sugar as well. It goes for carbs, so fat. Everything, the less refined option of it is a better idea. So now, I don't know whether they did it by choice, but I would like to believe that they had the common sense also to stick to foods that were as close to their natural form. And if that's one rule again, we can follow. Look at the food and see whether how close is it to the way it was supposed to be how much, I mean, some refining is needed, right? You can't survive without that, but as long as it is just mechanical refining, I think it's fine, rather than chemical refining. Uh, Sanjukta, I wanted to ask you something about millets. You mentioned millets. Um, you know, in our part, part of the country, we had more of muri, flattened and puffed rice, chire muri, uh, and not so much of jawar, bajra, and all that. So, uh, what would you recommend? Millets are coming back. So, uh, it's true that uh, what we eat is more of uh, rice and uh, wheat products. Uh, millet is always there. It is, uh, you can say sometimes people feel that it's a poor man food. Millet, uh, and uh, it's been encouraged to produce more millet. This is the year of millet. And uh, so we, we're working on this actually too, so that uh, our uh, chefs can uh, add millet items in the cafes. Millet is a very healthy food, we all know. And uh, if millet is added in the diet, it uh, has got a lot of nutritional value. And maybe the way it is promoted, even uh, nowadays, uh, we were working with a company called USEC, we are promoting uh, soya also. And you know this, uh, veg, uh, now people are not only vegetarian, now vegan, all those concepts are coming. And uh, as uh, the producer of food in the cafes and restaurants, I always said that uh, we have to have these items in the menu. Uh, yes, do people do eat more of sugar, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, more of uh, rice and uh, wheat-based products. And my, uh, But yes, millet is there in the... I think north side they do eat millets and uh, by uh, if in the uk millet is little different from millet we 
call in India. We actually it's uh, pearl millet and uh, other things. So, um, but I we feel that it will come back because it's very healthy and very nutritious. Why it can be used in cutlet? Is can and uh, they had used in sauce. You can use in wraps, and it's very healthy. Nutrition and value is very high in millet. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you something, Indrajit. Uh, you know about mishti, we have this entire, you know, life story, Bengalis particularly, where mishti plays such an important role. It's to do with our culture, with our imagination, our identity, and this excellence in creating all sorts of sweets. But does it sort of clash with, um, you know, healthy eating today? Not um, really. It depends on how much of sweets you eat. Um, you can have one shondesh a day, one small 10, 15 rupees shondesh, it won't Indra hurt you. Gita, sorry to interrupt. We yep. just have 10 minutes more. It's just a reminder. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so very much. <laughs> so, uh, if you have one shondesh a day, that doesn't kill. But gluttony is inside all of us. And if I have 10 shondesh a day and uh, go on for a week, it might have a bad effect. And basically, we are sweet people. So we love our sweetness. So we are the, we are the artists in that, in the entire India, entire Southeast Asia. And we can, we can fight and probably win the battle against any of the continent. So why not go with it? That's one of the most natural food that comes to us. The first taste that a baby experiences is sweet. And the last food that is served at the funeral is probably the sweets. All of our all of our religious activities they have got some part of sweet, a part of a small part of sweetness in it. So, I won't say sweet is bad. Quantity we consume that it varies. Right. So um, we'll just finish with one takeaway message from each of us. So Indrajit, what would your one singular takeaway message to everyone on eating uh, clean? Eat local. That's what I would say. Whatever is locally available, please, please go with it. You are brought up with that food that is in our systems that works for us. Fancy food is fine once or twice, but not regularly, please. That's what is my personal belief. Sanjukta? Uh, it's, uh, my message will be eating high healthy food, of course, and uh, uh, see to it that uh, you are happy eating. And uh, that's very important. And uh, eat, like uh, in, uh, Indrojit said, if you're hungry, you eat. <laughs> yeah. So I would like to say do not give up anything. Or do not say no to any food, because that's all you're going to think of. Hmm. I learned that very hard way in my practice. The moment you say no, ah. that's all the person can think of eating or, or want to eat. So do no. not say no to any food. Just cut to size things that are not so good for you. No food is bad per se. It's just the quantity of the food Moderation. that you decide. I mean, I think that's the consensus coming uh, in the whole talk. Mm -hmm. That is important. Like, for example, if I'm in Cal Calcutta he, today, I will definitely eat the sandesh that you suggested I should, the Nolan. Nolan Gur Nolan Gur sandesh. sandesh. So I'm going to definitely eat it. Uh. So do that. <laughs> so uh, my last word on this would be that, you know, uh, we got to remember that uh, millions of years ago, when Homo sapiens evolved, the human brain became bigger than other animals. Sugar wasn't abundant. So our brain ha is wired to push us toward sugar. Whenever you see sugar, uh, you know, get the taste or the smell, your brain, pleasure hotspots come up in your brain. and. Uh, your brain floods your body with dopamine, the feel-good hormones. So you sort of go towards sugar because sugar is the primary ingredient of life to give you energy. But today, we have too much sugar on, around us. They're, they hide under 300 names in our food chain. So beware of your ancient brain because we now live in the space age and we have a Stone Age brain. So beware of that. Be conscious whenever you go near, you know, food marts. If you go to uh, Chadni Chowk in Purana Delhi, you know that you will be tempted. 
the, all that smell. So avoid the, those places if you are uh, fighting with your health. That's my take on this. So here we end our session. If there's any question, uh, yes, please. Can't hear you. Why don't you say it loudly? I'll catch it. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. So I have a grandson now, and my daughter-in-law refuses to give her, give him any sugar or salt. Apparently, the doctors have said not to give sugar and salt for at least a year. Are you? What do you say to that? Kavita, would you like to address? Yeah, I know you're right. I think that is what uh, is going around now. All the doctors are going to kill me because an official platform are going to... I mean, I don't think that's right. I personally believe every taste needs to be given to the child. Of course, a minuscule amount. But maybe they have their own uh, reasons for it. I don't know personally the reason. No sugar, no salt. Yeah, I know, I know. I've been hearing that I a lot. Mean, Every time I've tried to give him something and I've been said, no, ma, that's not enough. <laughs> I know, I know. I don't want to start a fight between you and your child. But I don't know, somehow when we were born or my son was born, the first taste that was given was of honey, if I remember correctly. And that is in ancient um, I mean, custom, thinking. Yeah. It's a custom, but there is probably a science behind it. Now, this is what I've come to believe, that you know, whatever they were following, most of the things are proving correct today. Some we already know the reasons for, some we still don't know the reasons for, but trust me, that's what I write in the book as well. All of them are going to come out, the science behind it. So I would stick to the original. So better come out with this fast, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, they should. Salt maybe, yes, because both taste buds bad jate, but going no, nil salt, I don't understand. Less salt, I do understand. Um, I'm so sorry. I think we All ran right, out, we of, run time, out of time uh, for um, the question answer round. Um, I want to thank all our panelists, and I would also like to ask Shujata Ji to come up on stage and give a token of our appreciation to all of you. I just had one question, Kavita. May I? May I? Nayantara, can I ask one question? So, uh, one question. You know, we'll just, and the question is, I have heard a lot about these different diets. Yeah. You know, you eat 16 hours later, you fast. And the other thing is, during Christmas and New Year, you drink and eat as much as you want. And January, don't eat, don't drink. Is that of any value? So very uh, good question because I think a lot of people would be wanting to ask this and didn't. <laughs> so I'm so glad you asked. So we already in February now really would like to know how many people have managed to stick to their January 1st resolution. Has anybody? Okay, so he he is a... Okay, so the resolution was he won't be sticking to the resolutions. The fact is building health is a continuous process. It's not about one day or one week or one month or even one year is what I tell everyone. Every single morsel that you eat or not eat is adding on to your health or depreciating your health. So it has to be a continuous process. So resolutions do not work. You could decide today that today now you're going to start, not tomorrow. Monday never comes. The same way 1st January never happens. Uh, that's the first uh, the answer to the second question. The first question about the diets, I have a very clear definition of a fat diet. Any diet 
which asks you to remove any one food group from your diet completely yeah. is a fat diet. And the moment you hear that, you need to run away from it because it's not sustainable, it's not good for you, and it'll also not deliver what you're looking for, which is weight loss. Yeah, so this is very important. As far as intermittent fasting, which uh, ma'am mentioned specifically, uh, it's not a weight loss diet. I would like to make it very, very clear. But it is a good way to eat because it helps cut inflammation in our body and inflammation and immunity have become like a big buzzwords today. So it's a good way to eat. And traditionally, that's what fasting was. The traditional way of fasting that people used to follow. It's just given a fancy name today, intermittent fasting. So if your body can handle it and the kind of intermittent fasting, the number of hours your body can handle, just do that. Don't go to extremes, is what I would like to say. Thank you. So I would like to answer the question briefly with data. In last, say, 15 months, I have come down from 129 kgs to 106 kilos. Eating, I know, you would and love the answer. And you're not coming for the dinner tonight. Yeah. For eating, diet reasons. Eating everything from biryani to my rum. Whatever, what I did is, I controlled the portion size. I controlled the frequency of it having one biryani a month or maybe one a fortnight or something, some stuff like that. And with specific gaps in between. I have a jhalmuri in the afternoon. So probably I didn't, I used to skip meals which I have almost regularized. Probably she would be advising the same thing. I'm very sure on that part. So this is what I did probably. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question. Please stay tuned for our next session, which is about to begin shortly.